We have had a change in schedule today, so I hope you all had heard that. Uh, Lucy Vandenberg is not able to join us, uh, but I know that our program is going to be great. Um, and we all send Lucy our best wishes. She feel like the trip down from Polson was going to work for her today. I want to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the homeland of the Salish Kelsey people at a place they named Timson Clee. Their example as the original stewards of this land guides our work today. Tribal Trust Connection is committed to respectfully sharing the history and contemporary culture of the indigenous people who lived and traveled through the ancient crossroads on this land. We learn from many indigenous artists, elders, and organizations. We invite you to learn from and support them as well. I want to say a quick thank you to everyone who makes these programs possible. Members of Travel Trust Connection, the folks on Zoom who have made a donation at TravelTrust.org. We also want to recognize Montana Public Radio and MCAT, Missoula's Community Media Resource, who provided a media assistance grant to record Saturday storytelling each week this winter. Thanks to Hunter Bay Roasters for their donation of coffee, and to our board member, Megan McMeekin, for those delicious treats this morning. I want to remind folks that are on Zoom, it's helpful to keep yourself muted and your video off during the presentation. If you have questions for our speaker, please type them in the chat box on Zoom. We will monitor the chat for questions and for any technical difficulties you might have. Thanks to the generosity of our members, we also are able to provide ASL interpretation on the program on Zoom today. Folks who require interpretation, you might want to ping the interpreter next to the speaker. And now I'm pleased to introduce that speaker. Lee Silliman is a retired educator and museum employee living in Missoula, Montana. He was a Montana secondary level physics, chemistry, and math instructor for 43 years, as well as the part-time photo archivist for a county museum for 26 years. Since early childhood, he has nurtured a strong interest in the art and history of the 19th century American West. Lee began the craft of photography in 1979, built his own darkroom and picture framing shop in 1983. Utilizing his own photographs, the historic photos from the museum he managed, as well as vintage engravings that he has collected, Silman has assembled and circulated numerous exhibits that have been displayed in more than 90 venues throughout Montana and 10 other states. You all might remember Lee's fantastic collection of bison engravings that we had here last year, and we're looking forward to having another one of his exhibits starting in April. Lee's interest in photography, calligraphy, and Western Americana art and history has spawned many articles on these subjects, plus six books that he's edited or published. He's presented many conference lectures, taught numerous workshops, and led educational group tours. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Illinois, he is married and has two daughters. Lee. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Molly. And I'll try my best to deliver a, a really good program. Uh, I spoke to a visitor uh, in the lobby there about the program. He, he wasn't. Uh, knowledgeable about it, and I said, this is going to be on what I consider the very best wildlife artist of the American West, living or dead. So at the end of the program, <clears throat> I hope you will agree with me that I have delivered on that promise. <clears throat> so we'll get started. <clears throat> so Carl Rungus, um, <clears throat> as you can see on his dates there, um, was born in Germany, and he, um, I think, is the very best artist. And you'll see at the end of the program um, where you can find information. But I'm going to go into the details of his life, uh, how he created his art, and then some samples showing, I think, what he really um, accomplished. So we'll first look at his childhood, and then we'll go to um, his early trips to Maine and Wyoming and then <clears throat> showing how he worked very hard to learn about animals. Um, and then he learned really well how to paint landscape. And then <clears throat> we're gonna look into his, his artistic uh, methodology 
his uh, composition and his brushwork. And then <clears throat> he reared it into dry point uh, etchings. And then we're going to look at a number of his beautiful pictures. And then I'll tell you where you can see them all. <clears throat> I will mention right away that I brought two of the best books on Carl Angus. Uh, they're on that table uh, from my collection. And feel free to go up afterwards and look through them. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if they're in print, but they're fairly expensive, but they're really beautiful books. So, <clears throat> he was born to a wealthy family in Germany, and from a young age, he, he loved art. And uh, he did take some art classes. Uh, his father was a preacher, and his father really supported uh, the young man's uh, efforts in art. Um, as you can, pardon me, as you can see by the slide, uh, he was particularly interested in the uh, anatomy of animals. Uh, he would go to the, the uh, zoo to study them, and uh, his father even brought home dead cats for him to look at the anatomy. Because if you don't understand the bones and the muscle of an animal, how can you paint it? You know, you must understand the underlying structure in order to do a good job. <clears throat> so that's what he did. So he actually learned to uh, draw cats um, when he was a, a, a young fellow. Well, as he matured into his older years, um, as you can see, he was an excellent um, depictor of uh, even the human anatomy, as well as you'll see of, of animals. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, when uh, he was uh, a young man, he was influenced by German artists, as you can see there, and <clears throat> that was an inspiration to him, uh, just like Charles Russell was an inspiration to me. When I was in college, I used to go to the art library. I, I studied physics, chemistry, and math, but I loved to go to the art library and study Charlie Russell. And <clears throat> this was at the University of Illinois. And I love, <clears throat> pardon me, the landscape of Big Sky Country. I moved out here in 1969. I've loved Montana ever since. And so he fell in love with uh, wildlife art at an early age. And here's one of his early pictures showing some uh, farm animals. But let's get to what's interesting. Uh, he came to Wyoming um, in a, at an early age, and uh, he was very fascinated with the landscape and the animals there. Um, he was invited to stay at a ranch, and uh, these people continued to invite him back, and he really liked uh, the experience. So uh, let's look and see. He, he loved uh, hunting. He said at first, uh, most of what he did was hunting, and then he'd take a day off and do some art. But not too long into his career, he flipped that. He did uh, art most of the time and hunting less so. But hunting was an important part of his, um, his, his uh, methodology because he loved to get close to the animals and to study them. Um, so if you look at the these pictures, I think you'll see that from an early age, um, he was really developing his talents uh, quite well. Uh, he also was enamored of the Wind River Range, which is um, southwest, I'm sorry, southeast of Yellowstone National Park. I've had the pleasure of doing a week-long trip into the Wind River Range. It's a very high, craggy range. It uh, has rem uh, glacial remnants in it. It even has the highest peak in Wyoming, Cannon Peak. And uh, I was able to get halfway close. I'm not a mountain climber, I didn't climb it. <laughs> but I did photograph some climbers. But anyway, moving on. Uh, he had an uncle that uh, was very interested in uh, wildlife art. And that's, I think, spurred him on. Um, he loved to go camping uh, out in the wilderness. So there's a picture of his uncle. Um, who he became really close to, who shared his passion for hunting and the outdoors. 
Um, so it says, um, he, I can't quite read it from here, but anyway, he was really fascinated with uh, antelope. Um, they're a very fascinating species. Um, this does remind me, um, I've taught six classes for the Mali program at the University of Montana, and one of them was the art and history of American wildlife. And I do have a program on antelope. I love antelope. Uh, they're a fascinating uh, species. So maybe if Molly ever needs a, a, a substitute again, I can uh, tell you about the history of the Western antelope. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> at that time period, in the 1890s uh, and early 1900s, America was coming to realize that the frontier had closed as uh, a scholar had pointed out. There was no more em empty territory. Native Americans had been um, put onto reservations. And there was a developing ethic of land conservation. You cannot have wild animals to hunt and to view and to appreciate without the wild habitat for them to live in. So uh, Carbungus came to America at that time when there was a wellspring of effort to conserve our natural resources, the plants, and the animals, especially in the American West. So he came at a very opportune time. And this spearheaded by these three individuals that I have listed here, William Hornaday, um, George Bird Cannell, and um, can't quite read Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, obviously the President of the United States. Those were three leaders. Um, who were very much dedicated uh, to having wild country and people who could experience it uh, effectively. Well, in, in order to make a living, Carl would um, create a lot of artwork and he did a number of illustrations. This was true of so many artists, especially uh, in that time period um, that we're talking about here of the 1800s and early 1900s. It was hard for an artist to make a full-time living just painting pictures and selling them. So in the early careers of most of the artists, for example, Charles Russell and Frederick Remington, they had to be illustrators where they did pictures on the order of other people. And so here are some examples. Uh, the one on the left is about Carl Rungus. Um, the upper right one uh, was by Frank Tanny Johnson. I'm not even sure about the one on the right there, but. Artists were frequently employed to illustrate magazines and books. It was kind of the golden era of uh, illustrations. Nowadays we use photography, and now with um, artificial intelligence, who knows what's going to be drawing things. Uh, one of the important avenues for Mr. Rungus was getting to know these people who were educated in the leaders in the conservation movement and in the political structure of the United States. And one way of becoming noted by these people um, was to paint pictures for them. So here's one of the uh, clubs in New York City uh, that bought a number of his paintings, as you can see on the wall uh, around the tables there. So he was able to mix with these important people, and that spread his name and that allowed uh, him to sell more pictures, to raise his prices, and dedicate himself to uh, learning more about the craft that he was uh, in, in engaged in. Well, something providential happened in, uh, I believe it was 1910. A guide to the Canadian Rockies, Jimmy Simpson, who was like one of the best of the guides that was developing clientele to go into the Canadian Rockies. He invited Rungus to go on a, uh, a pack trip and uh, let him see the Canadian Rockies. Uh, I've been there uh, a couple of times and they are really fantastic. And the, the wild country just really, really excited him. And um, he was able to see um, wild uh, mountain sheep. Um, those in particular were really uh, uh, engaging to him. Uh, they would go on pack trips, as you have to do to go into most a lot of the back country. Um, this kind of scene is dear to me. 
I spent um, a couple of, at least one week or more every summer for 16 years going on a pack trip into the back country of Yellowstone National Park. It's really fun to um, go into the back country and set up a base camp and, and then go out on day hikes in the wilderness and, and that's what he was doing. So uh, Mr. Simpson invited him back again and the, the hook was set, so to speak, in his mouth. Uh, he needed no more encouragement. He had basically dedicated himself for the rest of his life to exploring the Canadian Rockies and the animals that lived in it. And there's a photograph of him on one of his pack trips. You have to pay your dues. If you're going to be a wildlife artist, you really have to see the country. You have to see the animals. You have to watch them. You have to immerse yourself uh, in the total blue that these creatures live in. And that's what he did. He sketched and sketched and sketched. He was always drawing. And because he was drawing directly from the animals, uh, that made his uh, results so skillful. So um, he even was acknowledged by Frederick Raymond, who at that time was the premier artist along with Charlie Russell. Uh, when you get a compliment from somebody like Frederick Remington, um, you're reaching near the top, as uh, I think he deserved. Well, uh, as you might have noticed from an earlier slide, uh, his uncle had a daughter who uh, he met when she was a young teenager, and he kept that idea in his mind, and eventually he married his cousin, um, as you can see there, and she went on a number of trips with him into the backcountry. So here's a picture of uh, him showing that even though he was killing the animals, he was making drawings and always wanting to, um, to depict the animal. You can see right here, that's the head of the uh, greenhorn sheep uh, that he had just uh, shot over here. <clears throat> so again, going into the backcountry was always important for him. And here's a picture showing how he would uh, make a tripod and hang the head. And because he was able to study it so closely, um, he was able to make really convincing uh, arrangements of the animal's uh, anatomy, their head and horns. And here's an elk. And I think you would agree that um, his training really paid off when you can examine them so closely. <clears throat> So this reminds me that, um, in a way, he was like John James Audubon, who preceded him. Uh, I've done a fairly in-depth study of John James Audubon. Uh, I owned, uh, I think, 80 or 90 of his uh, smaller original engravings. I gave a lot of them to the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. And some of them are in an exhibit right now um, at the Washington State Historical Society. So I've studied a lot of John James Audubon. He killed more birds probably than anybody in America because he needed to see them up close. This was in the 1840s, uh, well before photography of any kind that allowed you to get close to an animal uh, visually. And uh, in fact, one of his critics said, the birds flee when they see John James Audubon coming. Well, Carl Wallace did the same thing. In order to study these animals closely, he had to be a hunter. And as the quotation here, uh, if you read that, says that um, there was a good payoff, that people who hunted the animals, they really loved them, they allowed them to get close to them, and again, as I've said previously, it gave a political will to create the wilderness and the habitat that preserved these animals. So it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, uh, in exchange, so to speak, they had to forfeit their lives but in, for the greater good. <clears throat> so I think you can agree that um, his ability to get really close to these animals in the wild and actually see them after he had shot them uh, did pay off. He built a home uh, in um, Banff, and this is where he would spend his summers. Uh, making sketches and going out into the wilderness, and then he would go back to New York, uh, where he had a studio where he could work on some larger paintings, and, and network with these people who could buy his artworks and put them into publications. 
So he had a two part to his life, and I think that was really neat. I would emphasize that although he is noted, in my opinion, as the very best American wildlife artist, living or dead, I think he is a superb landscape artist. And I'll see if I can convince you of that. Um, here's a painting he did of uh, Yellowstone National Park before he dedicated himself um, to the Canadian Rockies. Here we see him painting a picture, I think, on the, is this perhaps on the Bow River. And the mountain in the background looks very similar to one of his sketches there. He was able to do uh, like 8 by 11 inch uh, canvases. He could whip them out in like an hour uh, with very quick uh, brush strokes. And that gave him the ability to capture beautiful background information for his animals. Because if all you have is the animal, you still don't have enough. You must have the <coughs> habitat that they were in. So if you see that picture there, uh, he put that into the background of that painting right there. I think I've got the two of them together. It's not an exact one-to-one, -one, but you can see that there's an inspiration from these field studies. So I'm going to show you some of his field studies. Um, and again, notice that he probably did all of those uh, 8 by 11 inch field studies in a, about in an hour or two. And this was very common for artists. Uh, some artists used photographs as their reference. Uh, this is called plein air painting, where you make your first impression on canvas or on paper and then that is the genesis of what you can develop in the studio into something bigger and grander, as you'll see here. So we'll just cruise through some of his beautiful field sketches here. And can you see the brush stroke is so uh, plain to see there? That takes amazing skill to use very few brush strokes and it's all wet at the same time if you're using oils, which he did. Um, you have to do all of that in an hour or so while you're sitting there. I think it's just incredible. And here's a little tangent, a little diversion. At that time, I think he was in, uh, in, uh, influenced by what was called the Group of Seven Artists, who were very prominent in Canada at that time. They were, there were, there were a number of uh, seven in particular, who formed uh, this group called the Group of Seven, and they were excellent landscape painters in Canada. And I don't have exact evidence, but I do believe that he was influenced by their landscaping skills and techniques. So keep these two artists in mind, uh, these two pictures here. I think you'll see that he was perhaps uh, influenced, whether directly or indirectly, I want you to notice that he has a very impressionistic technique for a lot of his foliage in the foreground. This struck me. I mean, doesn't that look uh, perfectly like, you know, the, the autumn foliage that you would see in the mountains? And yet, there's actually no, like, accurately depicted plant there. It's all just dots of paint and color and form that suggest it. So I think he was very much influenced by the impressionists. Um, that emanated out of uh, France and to the whole art world throughout, uh, throughout the planet. Again, here's another one showing his impressionistic handling of the, of the foreground foliage. So he would take his uh, field studies, as you can see here. Uh, the field study is uh, this thing right here. Uh, he would make some drawings, and we're going to talk about that briefly. And he would paint a bigger final product. So this was probably a photograph taken in his New York studio. Spend your time in the summer and fall when the weather's halfway decent out in the wilderness and then go back to your studio to work up um, on your bigger paintings. So there is the painting that you saw him uh, executing. And I want to draw attention to the fact that he had this, uh, this uh, these series of lines that he was drawing on his uh, canvases. And uh, it may not be real obvious to you, but I'm familiar with the golden mean. It's a ratio of 5 to 8. And it was very important from antiquity. The ratio of 5 to 8 was considered a very ideal ratio of like sky to land, 
or left to right. You don't just like cut your hand canvas in half. You don't have things right in the smack middle. You have differences in the areas of your painting. And uh, I've actually been influenced by that in my photography. Um, I try to use that concept of the golden mean, not having everything just absolutely centered. Um, so he had these lines and spaces always in mind um, when he was creating his compositions. And we're going to look more at that. Uh, he was influenced by um, a gentleman who developed a theory called the dynamic symmetry. And uh, as, as I'll begin to point out, his canvases had a, a fairly consistent formula. I want you to notice the diagonal lines there and how the focal point of your eye is drawn to where he forces you not only by the diagonal lines, but also by the light and dark, as we're going to look to in detail. So like, here's an example showing not dynamic symmetry. You'll notice it's back practically half sky, half land. Uh, you've got the object practically smack in the middle. You have perpendicular lines, uh, vertical and horizontal there. This is the antithesis. Even though this is one of Carl's paintings, that's the antithesis of his style that he developed as he matured. So there's a mature painting. Can you see how he's using intersecting diagonals and triangles and he's placing this animal at, a, at, a, um, at, a, at an ideal uh, point uh, in relation to those. Again, uh, here's one of my favorite pictures of a grizzly bear. And notice as you recede into the background, those receding triangular planes, it makes for a fascinating, I think, symmetry to artwork. Um, there's hardly any horizontal and vertical us to any of his paintings from here on. <clears throat> so I'll go through some samples showing that, that there's always these diagonals in his best paintings. Now let's get to the idea of value. <clears throat> value means the light or darkness. Now, I'm a black and white photographer, so I'm always looking at something and trying to disregard the color, like I'm looking at Mr. Mihalish there with his red shirt. That doesn't mean anything to me. His shirt would be maybe a medium gray, whereas Tam in the middle here has a light gray top on. So as a black and white photographer, I can see that she would show up more uh, in uh, a black and white photograph. So the idea of value is lightness and darkness, shades of gray, okay? So he is a very, very skillful use of the light and dark in his pictures. What I want you to do is to squint at this picture and tell me which animal you see. Go ahead and squint so you can barely see through your, your eyelids. And you notice, what do you see? You obviously see that animal right up there. Because does it have the most contrast between light and dark? Absolutely. So uh, these other animals are visible to you as you look at it with your eyes plain and open, but they fade away in comparison to the value contrast of where he wants to draw your attention. And he's going to do that over and over. So I learned this uh, in this important book by Maitland Graves. Uh, I was a calligrapher uh, at the time when I started photography and I bought that book and it was a game changer for me. And I think um, that Mr. Rungus knew all about that. Notice again, where did he put the most contrast? Right where he wanted your uh, attention to go, didn't he? Again, I put it into a value contrast compared to, you see things in the world in color, but he's thinking also in the world of value, light versus dark, which is what I do as a black and white photographer. Not only, not only can you put a darker object against a lighter background, but can you do the opposite? Can you put a lighter object with a darker background? So where is your eye drawn? Immediately to the face of the cougar there, aren't you? And so none of this is an accident. This is all very carefully calibrated by the artist as he's creating his artworks. 
You can even use uh, a medium gray as the background. Where do you look? You obviously look right there, don't you? Um, and that is no accident that he's putting a canvas of gray rock right behind where he wants you to look. It's not an accident. I hope I've infected you with that idea of value contrast. I'm always thinking of that. <laughs> By the way, um, before I forget, I, I just brought two of uh, Carl Rungus's pictures here uh, that I'm donated to uh, Traveler's Rest Connection. And again, can you see that he's using value contrast? Uh, the one on this side is a dark figure with a light background. And over here, we have light figures against a dark background. None of that is by accident. And notice particularly the diagonals here, less so here, but there's still nothing is perfectly horizontal and vertical. I'm beating you over the head with this idea, aren't I? <laughs> All right, so let's just cruise through some of his pictures and I think you'll see that he is very intentionally drawing your attention with value contrast and dynamic symmetry and the, va and the, usi the usage of um, intersecting diagonal lines and triangles. There is absolutely no doubt where he wants you to look in these paintings. And yet, I want you to always keep in mind, look at the background. Wouldn't a painting without those animals been a magnificent landscape? Keep that in mind as we scroll through some of these. His ability to paint a landscape, I think, was only second and not very far behind to his ability to depict the animals. And that's the, on the cover of my book there. I do hope, Jean, you want to hold that up and show everybody? I want you all to uh, come and take a look at, uh, at that book right there. I'm sure the libraries have a copy. If they don't, you should suggest they buy one. Uh, it's not a cheap book, but um, it's a really, it's full of uh, beautiful pictures. And of course, you can Google his name and uh, go on the internet. And I have to confess, I swiped a lot of these pictures off the internet. <coughs> Um, he turned in his later years to dry point etching, where he actually drew a metal plate, I think it was copper, and he took some of his best paintings and literally transferred them into dry point etchings. Again, he's, he's thinking in value terms. Well, this is black and white value terms, isn't it? So he, he is showing that his mastery goes not only from color, but into black and white. So we'll go through some examples here of where he takes his beautiful paintings and turns them into beautiful dry points. I think another reason why he liked dry point is you can sell those for a lesser value. Uh, when you're trying to make a living selling paintings, you need to sell them for thousands of dollars. Dry points you can make multiple copies of, uh, and they usually make maybe a few hundred or a thousand, and the artist will sign them, you know, like 150 out of 900 and sign them. And so the ordinary person could maybe buy those for 100 or two or 300 dollars during his lifetime instead of many, many thousands that his oil paintings had to bring. So I think that was very uh, thoughtful of him to render some of his artwork in, in medium that was not only beautiful but affordable to other people. Notice he turned that one around. And the way you do that, if you're looking at a picture, like let's say, let's say my hand right here is a picture, okay? If I look at that and draw that on a plate, how do you make the picture? You turn the plate, if this is what I just drew, I have to turn it over and make an impression on a paper that reverses it left to right. So uh, that's what was going on. Some of his paintings are reversed left to right once he goes from if you draw it like that and you turn it over and print it, it reverses it. I bet you didn't think of that. <laughs> Another reversal. Another reversal. That's a little different than this one over here, but not too much. Uh, 
accidentally the same picture twice. <laughs> Once again, is it usually in value contrast to draw your attention to what he wants you to see? All right. I've assembled what I call uh, his mature years gallery. Um, that is the uh, picture that you see over here. Uh, real deer in Boston County, Montana. So we're just going to cruise through a number of pictures uh, that I think reinforces my claim that he's the very best living or dead American wildlife artist. And I say North American. I love those autumnal colors. Aren't his mountain backgrounds just fantastic? Did you remember to think of dynamic symmetry and value <laughs> contrast? And that does remind me, uh, as I said, I'm a black and white photographer. Sometimes when I'm out in the, in the boonies, we'll come to something that really looks fantastic and I won't even take a picture of it. Do you know why? There's no contrast. It'll just be all gray, and it won't make a good picture. So sometimes color and form, when you're seeing it in real life, you don't realize how it could all be the same value and might not make a good picture. I just throw that in for photography. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how many paintings he did? I don't have the, the accurate number, but I think it's over a thousand. He lived into his 90s, so uh, his, his output, if you include the dry points, was probably at least two or three thousand paintings. Artists who lived a long time can can put out that much work, especially if you want to count as field studies, which um, you usually do. <clears throat> I 
Now, is that for contrast? Molly, while I'm speaking about photography, can I put in a plug? <laughs> I have an exhibit at Gallery 709 in Missoula of my black and white photography over three and a half decades of um, unusual oddities of nature. And I think you'll see in every one of them its value contrast. Um, if there's something I want you to look at that's either light against a dark background or it's dark. <coughs> You know what I mean. Dark against light or light against dark. <laughs> You're probably getting the picture right now. Ooh, look at the sky there. Now that's somewhat unusual. He's mostly painting the landscape, but here he is using the sky as his backdrop. All right. If I'm impressed upon you, the virtue of Carl Rungus's art, where can you go to see it? The closest and best place uh, is probably Jackson, Wyoming, at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. It's a very beautiful museum uh, that's built a couple miles north of Jackson. And not only does it showcase Carl's um, work, but it has a number of other galleries with other artists. And <clears throat> they have one whole large, large gallery devoted to uh, his art. So here's another picture of it. And they also have a lot of his field, his field sketches. Um, these are very, very valuable paintings. He, his canvases tended to be big. Uh, for example, over here, these are probably smaller than his real canvases. So he, he, he um, painted them on a fairly large scale. Uh, the Grand Teton Lodge, um, back in the early 20th century, he had some of his paintings uh, up, up high. So I know some of them were like um, a size like this, you know, three or four feet, maybe by five or six feet. They're really big canvases, because they had them displayed up high so that people could walk around and still see them. So we're not talking about his finished paintings being small. His field sketches were, but his, his final product was usually of a pretty decent size. So I strongly suggest, um, when next time you go to Yellowstone, drop down into the Tetons and Jackson, Wyoming, and look at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. And another place to see it is the uh, Glenbow Museum in Calgary, and they have a fantastic collection of his wildlife art. And as I was pushing, uh, we've got a, a, a book there of his color pictures. And Jane, since you're being my assistant here, grab the other book. There's another beautiful book uh, filled with his uh, dry point etchings. Uh, hopefully, either the libraries have those, or um, we can get the librarians to buy a copy. Um, and so that's what you can enjoy in your own uh, living room and on the internet. And I want to tell you um, how people value his art today. Uh, I think a measure of an artist's work is how, after he's dead, the value of his art is it. Is it stable? Is it rising or is it declining? Uh, the art market is very fickle. I watch Antique Roadshow and uh, it can go up, it can go nowhere, and it can go down. It's a uh, crapshoot. Not Carl Rungus. His prices have steadily gone up. Uh, one of his paintings recently, that one there, sold for more than half a million dollars. And I went on the internet, uh, oh, here's another one. What does it say there? I can't quite read it. 100 and some thousand? 195,000, that's more than I have. <laughs> uh, for, uh, and I didn't know he did very much in uh, three-dimensional art. That's actually fairly rare for him. Uh, and I looked up on the internet. Um, this one uh, was coming up for sale. It was estimated at more than half a million dollars um, for the estimated cost. At eight, was it up to 800,000, I believe? Yeah. So, so his artwork is being more and more appreciated all the time. Uh, I believe that's the last slide I have, so I would be glad to um, entertain some questions. Molly, we have some time, don't we, for, do. we have time for some questions and answers. Savannah. Was there any animal that frequented more often in his paintings? Do you think he had a favorite? The question was, is there an animal that was more often in his paintings? I would say it looks like mountain sheep uh, were one of his favorites, and uh, mountain goats, I think.
think their um, the lightness of their color and the curl of their horns, and not far behind was the grizzly bear. I would say those three, uh, if, if you were watching and making any kind of mental tabulation, I think those were his three favorites, especially in that last set I was showing you, the, the bighorn sheep was uh, appearing quite often. So those antlers uh, of um, not only the, the bighorn, but uh, elk and deer and caribou, I think, uh, that allowed him to show off his, his skills. Good question. Mr. Mahalish. Um, symmetry and contrast. You got that through. Um, the question is, do you detect that in Russell or Remington paintings as well? <clears throat> That's a good question. Repeat the question. Oh, yes. The question is, um, I made a a note that I've impressed upon you that Rungus was very enamored of contrast, value contrast, and dynamic symmetry, diagonals and triangles. And the question was from Bruce, do I see that in Russell and Remington? It doesn't jump out at me, especially dynamic, um, triangular, angular uh, composition. But I do think the value contrast is something that those two artists had constantly in mind, um, very definitely. I, I think, uh, I, I like representational art, and especially art of the 19th century, and I think uh, value contrast is significant in every artist that rose to prominence. Uh, not only those two that you mentioned, but Thomas Moran and, um, and others, they're always thinking of not just color, but the lightness and darkness, because that really draws your attention. So I do think it was subtly, especially the value contrast was important, less so for that dynamic symmetry. He was really a freak on those <laughs> diagonals. <laughs> Molly. We have a question from Zoom. Sure. Um, can you go back to his training a little bit? And was he entirely self-taught? Did he go to art school? I believe it said he did attend the academy, but he wasn't enamored of it very much. I think for the most part he was self-taught. Um, I think this has to be true with a lot of artists. Charlie Russell was 99% self-taught. Now there, and so is uh, Remington. Remington went to, uh, I believe, uh, an art school for a semester, and he hated it. I mean, he's supposed to draw, you know, vegetables and fruit and <laughs> lettuce. <laughs> on a table. I mean that, and Charlie Russell lived in St. Louis and he sees these mountain men and Indians and frontiersmen come up and down the Missouri River. So, um, those three I think were mostly self-taught even if they had a little bit of academic training, but they were influenced by other successful artists of their time. So they're absorbing informally the art that is selling and, and is it's considered valuable in their day. So <clears throat> while you may not be getting formal training, I think these artists' eyes were entirely open to what was going on and learning from their peers. So it was an informal, and I feel that way too. Um, in my career as a photographer, uh, you can take lots of expensive workshops, and I decided not to do that. I spent my money on mule outfitters who took me into the back country. My film was very expensive. My chemicals were expensive. Um, I study, I, I bet I have a hundred books of photography by the great masters of the medium. And so even though I didn't take any formal training, I absorbed so much that I could on my own. I, I think that's what um, artists generally do. Um, there's formal training and informal training, and um, the more of both is better, but the informal, I think, is really critical. So this, got another question from Zoom? Uh, yeah, so sort of building on what you were just saying, <clears throat> do, do we see Rungius influencing another generation of artists? That's a question I'm not calibrated to answer, but I will hazard a guess. 
Uh, I've been several times to the National Museum of Wildlife Art, and in my mind, they come up to Rungus' standards. It's hard for an artist, I think, to surpass uh, the masters. I mean, every artist has their differences. Uh, their style is always different. I can look at a painting from across the room and almost tell you who the artist is um, by their style. So the question is, do, do other artists that came after him, his contemporaries and modern uh, painters of wildlife art, and there are very good ones. Um, the name Bateman uh, comes to my mind. I don't study 20th century and 21st century um, art that much. But I know that, for example, they have value contrast is extremely important in their art. I mean, that's, it's almost a commonality for most artists. Um, I would say to a certain degree, he had to have been an influence, yes. Uh, they used different mediums. Uh, maybe they picked different animals. A lot of uh, artists excel in African wildlife art because African wildlife is so spectacular. And he, of course, reserved himself for uh, Northern Rocky Mountain uh, fauna. Good questions. Uh, this gentleman back here. So talking again about his use of uh, diagonals, is that more of a conscious artistic decision of my paintings will look better if I do this? Or is it more of an observation that there's no straight lines out in nature, so his paintings then looked more realistic by doing that? I think it's a combination of both. Um, first of all, obviously the Canadian Rockies are full of diagonals, and that's what he loved. So he, it's natural that that appeared in his paintings, but I think it was a very conscious effort. Even when you don't see much mountains in the background, I mean, I could probably go back uh, a few of the, uh, the slides, and well, let's take a look at this one. The mountains aren't that impressive in the background, but it's still diagonal. Um, we can probably find some more like that. Um, actually, that one doesn't really show very much diagonalness, does it? Um, but here, the mountains aren't all that impressive, but still he uses his diagonal, the diagonal cliff face there. So I think he was very intentionally influenced by the concept of Dio. And that's very important, like in that book, The, the uh, Theory of Color and Form by Nathan Graves. Um, diagonals have been used throughout all our history to create a sense of movement. Uh, we think a horizontal and vertical is static. You know, the land is mostly level, the ocean is level, trees and vegetation go up and down. So the idea of diagonals is more conducive to the idea of movement and interest. Um, that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think he consciously did it. And as you pointed out, his landscape was full of diagonals anyway. <laughs> and that's what he was drawn to. Galen. Um, you said that he was painting these at a time when a lot of uh, large influences were pioneering for uh, conservation of lands. Right. Do you think that part of his painting and part of the intention of his painting was to get people to care for <coughs> these lands and for the conservation of these animals as well? Can you repeat that? Yes, the question, good question. Um, the question is, uh, he was in the forefront of this movement that was trying to create a uh, conservation ethic to preserve land and animals uh, for future generations. And so the answer to that is, I don't know that he specifically created his art for that purpose. I know that, for example, Ansel Adams, the great black and white photographer of the 20th century, he very consciously gave his artwork, his paintings, to conservation organizations to try to arouse um, political movement to, for the Wilderness Act and so on, and, and preservation of national parks, and, et cetera. I don't know that Rungus actually had that in mind, um, but I know that his artwork, to the degree that it went out there into the public, and it did, his paintings were 
like widespread, especially as reproductions. Um, I think that influenced people to value the animals, and if you value the animals, you have to value the landscape they live in. So it was an indirect effort, it wasn't a direct effort on his part. I have another question from Zoom, um, asking about the group of seven from Canada. Were they Runx's contemporaries? Did he interact with them? Um, were they, and, or did he mostly see their work and absorb influence just from their work? I'm not totally knowledgeable on that. I'm going to hazard the guess that he wasn't directly connected to them, but I think he was influenced by them. Uh, he's living in Canada for his half his life and more, and they were very important. Um, I would say the group of seven in Canada is comparable to Remington and Russell is to the American West. So he was probably very aware of them. Um, it's been a long time since I've actually read uh, the biography of Fungus, so I, and it didn't pop out to me in my memory that he was directly influenced by them. But I have a book at home, uh, and every time I see Rungus and go through the book of uh, these seven artists, their form, their color has so much in common that I, I think it was a synergistic interplay between these artists. Most artists are aware of the others, even if they don't communicate with them. They see what's popular, they see what's selling. Um, they may not be on a first name talking basis, but I think they all have their eyes open. <laughs> More questions? Uh, I'm, I, I have to apologize. I don't think I repeated the question that the gentleman had read. Um, no, I think she, he's sitting close enough to the camera microphone okay. they got it on Zoom. All right. All right, well, can we all say thank you to the agreement? <laughs>